we are discussing PP surgeons in the time of COVID-19. Um, I'm just sharing what we have learned over the few weeks. Um, we were uh, we started the training program in your international conference. And um, whatever I'm sharing in this presentation is, is um, was done as a part of your training program, the material that was gathered at that time. So the aims of the discussion today are to discuss the risk of transmission in the surgical team, a little bit of understanding on that. What are the available methods for risk minimization? I've discussed, I'm discussing the individual PPE components today and how they come together in the donning and the doffing process. And what are the common errors we are seeing with the, uh, with the doctors and the nursing team during the training as well as in the actual execution of the process? Um, <clears throat> There are a lot of guidelines now um, with regard to uh, surgery at the time of uh, COVID. Um, we found the NHS, the Royal College of Surgeons, they have put together a, a, a beautiful um, uh, guideline, which is available in the link that is given below. Uh, uh, people can follow that up. Um, for, they are divided into emergency, urgent, level two, level three, and level four, uh, where the operation needs to be done within 24 hours with level one emergency and can be beyond three months in level four. The, the actual list is quite big and I could not convert it into a slide. So what I have done is I have given you the link. I think uh, uh, you can actually take them up um, by looking at the link and then uh, uh, look up for further information. Now, there's a lot of discussion in different forums about the use of laparoscopy and how things can get transmitted. A lot of discussion in many forums in WhatsApp and Facebook. Uh, so I looked at the COVID-19 transmission through different body fluids. So I, the, the definitive role in uh, transmission... Is Dr. Vijayalakshmi here? No, 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 not yet, not yet. Yeah. So the definitive role in transmission, it comes from respiratory droplets and from aerosols. The suspected role in transmission is mainly from stools. There are a few papers which report fecal oral transmission. And I did find a couple of papers on ocular secretions. I've given some of the references here. We have no clear role in transmission from these body fluids, vomiting, vomit, urine, breast milk, vaginal secretion, semen, and from the blood. Uh, the blood transmission being absent from these respiratory virus We've also collated from experience that are gained from SARS and the MERS-CoV, which has been reported before. There has been no transmission through blood. So uh, for surgeons, you can be quite confident that if you have a blood contamination, that is not going to transmit COVID. The big risk procedures in the hospital are aerosol generating procedures. And these are the only times where you have to be very strict with your personal protective equipment. So, uh, uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi is here under the name J. Ramu. I was wondering. That's my husband's name. <laughs> okay. You are misled as Vijayalakshmi. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you, sir. So, um, the, that's the only, P, only time where you require a full PPU. So, I have labeled it as aerosol preventing PPE. And uh, whenever you do an aerosol generating procedure, even in a negative pressure room, the aerosol can remain as long as 47 minutes. So I've roughly given most of the people 50 minutes um, in, uh, in rooms where there is minimal air, uh, even there is good air exchange. So the kind of operating room that is required for PPE procedures are negative airflow rooms, which are available in very few hospitals, even in the larger ones. So th these are some of the procedures where you, one must be very, very careful. Intubation, extubation, CPRs, open suctioning of airways, manual ventilation, by which I mean manual bag mask ventilation. When you disconnect the patient from the ventilator, when you do upper airway procedures or surgeries, tracheostomies, bronchoscopies, like that. Even chest physiotherapy can induce coughing and aerosol procedure. I see the insertion is including pigtails or high um, or also considered possible aerosol generating procedure or droplet generating procedure because they can be associated with cough. And the references, I mean, there's a very beautiful reference given in from the Harvard Medical School, um, the Brigham Hospital yeah, under covidprotocols.org. It's very interesting. It's very good data. 
the protocols are actually shared so that um, you can directly take it and use it in your practice. I also looked at SAGE's guidelines for minimal in, minimally invasive surgeries in the time of COVID-19. Uh, the um, Comparing open versus minimally invasive surgeries, which one is safer? Actually, there is no data, no one knows. But for length of stay considerations within the hospital, we are still preferring laparoscopy. We did a couple of uh, uh, lab, hot lab colleagues and uh, one of our GI colleagues is also doing routine um, laparoscopic surgery. Now, PPE is recommended by the sages for all staff, regardless of whether you do an open laparoscopic or a robotic surgery. Now, lap leads to aer aerosolization of blood-borne viruses. So there's a lot of fear among people about leaking uh, through the port and stuff like that. It is true that there is aerosol aerosolization, especially when you use a high pressure carbon dioxide to create the pneumoperitoneum and the pressure setting is around 16 but they are mostly studied for blood-borne viruses. And SARS-CoV-2 is not a blood-borne virus. So uh, I'm not able to uh, um, understand why there is so much discussion in laparoscopic forums about uh, spread through port leaks. Now consider filter for released carbon dioxide to capture aerosolized particles. Again, I look for this evidence. There is no ev evidence of any uh, viruses in the peritoneal fluid. Um, sorry. Sages recommends another, another, some of the practical measures they have done is smaller incision for ports if you make a larger one. And if there's a leak around the port, there's possibility of aerosolization. But again, I, I, I tend to disagree with them because this is not a blood borne virus. Uh, it is also recommended to use minimal carbon dioxide pressures and a smoke evacuation system. But the key, and also they have suggested evacuation of the new peritoneum prior to pulling out ports, prior to closure of the ports, uh, specimen extraction and conversion. I think they are just being safe because being a biological um, uh, situation, people tend to be more careful because the evidence may be evolving. Now, Sages has put a beautiful um, infographic on this. So minimize the number of theta staff when you do surgeries. Next, and please expect all of your staff, staff to wear the personal protective equipment. Now, this in India is, is, a, is a major undertaking, I have understood. Um, a lot of nurses, doctors do not have PPE training, and this is a little difficult to implement. With regard to uh, service rationalization, that is not required for the current discussion. You're doing laparoscopy. There is little evidence of MIS risk specific to COVID, as I said earlier, and it does reduce the length of stay. Um, a filter to, uh, for release carbon dioxide is advised and minimization of energy devices. But laparoscopy is dependent on energy devices, so I don't know how we can correlate with that. But like I said, dividing peritoneum, I don't feel that we are disseminating the virus. Practical measures with regard to a dedicated OR for COVID-19 is still not in place in many hospitals. And I think uh, the acceptance of doing uh, surgeries on COVID is still not there for many people. We might accidentally contaminate ourselves, but I don't know whether people will be more proactive in doing patients with proven COVID. Uh, endoscopy is out of our discussion today. So I also looked at whether mucosal openings during uh, laparoscopic or open surgery can lead to... Ilango, uh, shall we let in uh, um, Delixmi at this juncture uh, before we can argue? You just said the endoscope is out of discussion. But anyway, oh, okay. till, till, till uh, now, uh, whatever we have discussed, we'll see what Vijay uh, sure. has got to say. Then we'll continue with your slides. Sure. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Um, I came a bit late. I'm very sorry. So we're discussing about uh, things about laparoscopy and uh, COVID. The problem with COVID is we don't know a lot about it. Very likely it will turn out to be droplet mediated. Very unlikely to be uh, airborne. We can't be very sure. We don't know. They're still talking about GI being a cause because there was a latest, there was one article by from France recently where they correlated the number of people infected with the fecal contamination, the amount of virus from the fecal, uh, from the wastewater. 
So there has been a hypothesis whether they could be transmitted by fecal oral route also. We are not sure. It could just be the shedding particles. It could be the dead dead virus also. Similarly, there is a lot of queries about uh, what happens during laparoscopy. Initially, during the Ebola season, you might all remember they were talking about uh, aerosolization and spreading and surgeons getting infected in the theater by Ebola. Then I am eventually picked up to be contact alone. At this point of time, we don't know much about COVID too. So COVID. So we will assume it is one thing which can spread. So if that is so, then what do we do? Is what we should look into. First, during a laparoscopic procedure, few things come in. First, you generally intubate the. Please, if I can interrupt, is this blood borne? As what uh, Ilango says. It is. No, it is actually, not. It's not. It is not blood borne, but there will be a transient viremia initially, and also when they develop pneumo uh, pneumonia and multi-organ dysfunction, at that time also there will be trans. There will be viremia. So, in, during these two phases, there is a chance of it acting like a blood borne virus. As of now, we don't have evidence for blood borne spread. See, but you have seen patients, people operating and then developing the illness. We are not sure. Like those who have succumbed to this are people who have been operating in high aerosolized zones, like cardiothoracic surgeons, neurosurgeons, orthopedicians, where they drill the bone. So aerosolization is much more. And these are patients who are probably not very symptomatic. They're doing it early into the disease. So we also know it colonizes. They can be transient viremia and no, then no, develops no, no. Again, a yeah, sorry to interrupt. If it is not blood born, why are surgeons getting uh, uh, affected? Is the so, uh, could get affected? The point yeah. is that we, when we call about blood born, what the usual dictum of what blood born means, it has it is spread from one person to another through blood born methodology. That's through blood transfusions or that is what is blood born. As of now, we don't have a clear proof that it is blood borne. The assumption is the aerosolized droplets during intubation or during procedure causes it. But we have seen patients who do these drilling and stuff developing it. So the hypothesis of probably during the transient viremia phase, they are developing it, whether it is aerosolizing is coming into the picture. We still don't know. This is only a hypothesis. We don't know. So, uh, as, as, as you say, endoscopy is more dangerous than laparoscopy. Yes, yes it is. Yes, 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 yes. I, I don't know. Bashi wants to uh, uh, chip in here with his comments. Uh, okay, I'm, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I also have a concern about the uh, the off pump surgery. You know, when we use, uh, see, we uh, produce aerosols during stenotomy because especially. First stenotomy, second stenotomy, even it will be, it will be more. Then uh, other area which we are, we we use uh, you know uh, carbon dioxide spray for the uh, for off pump surgery. So one of the things I was talking to my assistant in the UK, uh, he was saying they stopped almost uh, off pump surgery completely in that center because uh, of course we can do on pump. But one question I I, I want to ask you is whether. Uh, just routine suctioning, you see, because we have to suck out a lot of blood during cardiopulmonary bypass. Just that suction produce any, any, I'm sure it will be producing aerosols, isn't it? It will, sir. It will, sir. Uh, the only yeah. thing is, all these things should happen in the initial transient viremic phase, uh, which should uh, be brief. That is, yeah. we should be unfortunate enough to operate on the patient who has got yeah. a transient viremia and not sick enough to have symptoms. Yeah. Now, the problem is, I, I, I tell you, like you said, it is very difficult to differentiate. See, for example, a patient is a carrier and uh, during intubation itself, in, they will have a lot of virus in his mouth. So, whether the surgeon gets from that aerosol or from the operating is very difficult unless we, we prove it. It's a very, very difficult thing because it could be he is having a lot of organisms in the nasopharynx and he is there sucking during the induction of anesthesia and other problems. But uh, we may be attributing to the aerosols which producing in the operating room. Is there any evidence to differentiate between uh, as such of now? No, sir. As of now, no. Yeah. So yeah, that is yeah, the that reason. Is, yeah. That okay, is the reason ahead. we say intubate, go, uh, go as a serial entry rather than parallel entry. So yeah. initially somebody intubates, finishes off, there should, there should be some time gap. Now, uh -huh. how much is a big question. It can be even uh, like even half an hour, 40 minutes may not be enough. That's where the problem comes. So if okay. there is a susceptible, uh, suspected COVID patient, maybe in a negative pressure OT, you intubate, wait for some time, maybe around half an hour. And again, I'm not sure about the timing. I'm mm -hmm. assuming at least at least 30 hour exchanges are sucked out and then, and then go in and start up the procedure. 
and okay. probably the anesthetist takes all the precautions stringently before okay. intubation they don't do the usual things they don't use a bag straight away into the ventilator hma filters on both the limbs those kind of things should be followed okay can oh, that's have a comment dr kanan uh, i just died sorry <laughs> okay fine yeah um please me yes can you yeah so i mean that's the reason we've been talking about serial entry rather than parallel entry so minimal number of people in the icu especially first anesthetist finishes it off comes stays at a distance at least some at least as much as they they can from the surgical field so they stay over there intubate and then after half an hour or so surgeon and the nurse scrub nurse goes in and starts it off especially when you are going to do in a emergency setting i'm talking about emergency surgeries when you don't have covid testing you just have a ct report saying there is no patch but you cannot be really sure about the early viremia those kind of patient we probably should follow the precautions yeah ela go yeah uh that's an interesting discussion so uh, when i looked at there is absolutely no blood borne spread anywhere i think uh, anesthetists are more careful yeah till now they looked at the infected people in uh, uk the highest risk group is the surgeons i think uh, none of the intensivists or the um uh, anesthetists got infected but i think it's basically because they follow good ppe and they take extra care and precautions during the intubation because they know it's a definitive aerosol procedure and like i said uh, i i think the waiting time is rough, roughly 50 minutes now i looked at among the ilam the, among the surgeons is orthopedic surgeons and cardiac surgeons as you see i don't so know i think uh, i i'll touch upon that little later um there's a lot of problems in the ppes so i'll i'll go to it little later we have time to discuss that for uh, gi surgeons i think uh, there's a lot of questions about mucosal openings during surgery in covid obviously there are ac2 inhibitors in the small bowel and there have been biopsies showing plasma cell infiltration and uh, inflammation within the lamina propria of the small bowel the information is limited in hc we do not know whether when we divide the bowel with um, cautery or with uh, uh, harmonic scalpel create an aerosol and that can lead to uh, a transmission that we are not sure of so um the first contact precaution probably uh, we should learn is good hand hygiene um since it looks very low um i have not actually put up the slides but after going through a lot okay, of no, sorry to interrupt when you say what is your hand hygiene as compared to dr vijayalakshmi's hand hygiene so uh, uh, let me tell my my policy first um our we have seven steps 20 seconds to 30 seconds for alcohol on a clean hand if it is dirty it is 40 to 60 seconds of hand wash it's just like a surgical scrub sir whatever we do in the operating room i i do it every time um i think it has become a habit uh, since the covid epidemic pandemic started so even when i uh, when i enter the hospital do some smaller procedures i wash my hands most of the time so that is what i am doing um part of the uh, i mean that that probably was initiated by my by me training all the nurses to do that and i also encouraged the nurses to look at my own hand washing and tell me the problems that they are uh, facing with me uh, dr vijay lakshmi your comments like we i haven't done anything special one thing that has happened which i can tell you now is there is zero cross infection rate in our icu at this point of time the numbers are low now but it was quite high for the last two months and it is zero cross infection rate now the nurses know the importance of hand hygiene i have not added any steps extra the same thing has been told them told to them we told them there could be covid cases lurking in between the patients and we may not know and you may develop covid that's the only thing which made them wash their hands correct yeah <laughs> um so beyond the hand hygiene um since we were we were looking for ppes uh, we had to decide a few questions on the use of gloves um whether single glove is good or double glove we have actually chosen a double glove because we found it easier to doff and uh, keep the ppe intact so that's our policy um the the cuff the outer glove cuff should extend over your uh, surgical gown or the ppe uh, sorry the coverall cuff 
So we, we are looking for longer, slightly longer gloves. Uh, there have been recommendations about 220 to 230 millimeters on that uh, length. But an but a unsterile glove that is commonly available is probably good enough from the safety point. We are currently using latex uh, gloves, um, but we found that the nitrile gloves were very good during training, but it's very difficult to obtain nitrile gloves now at least at this point of time. And uh, the last question was to use it over the cuff or under the cuff. We are using it um, currently at the inner glove under the cuff and the outer glove over the cuff. That makes our doffing process quite simple. Uh, uh, it, it is a local adaptation. I mean, people can disagree with that as well. No, no, so we now, are also doing the same thing. You're also doing the same thing. That's same nice thing. to know. So a lot of questions I had to answer myself. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> Uh, if I have to ask you here, is there any yeah. difference in quality between sterile and unsterile gloves in terms of pore rates? Absolutely not, sir. Absolutely not. For uh, any what procedures you don't, I mean, procedures you probably need sterile gloves. Just protection is a personal protection for the nurse, for the healthcare worker. You don't need a sterile glove. You just need a glove. You need a surface between your hand and the patient. That's it. But and Dr. Bashi, that, Dr. Bashi, whenever you want to comment, please unmute your phone and do, sir. Okay. Whenever, you, whenever you want to comment, you just unmute. Rest, rest of the times, only the speaker's phones okay, are. Okay, okay, no problem. Go ahead, I'm listening. Yeah, yes, but anytime you can comment here. Yeah. Okay. So, after, um, after this COVID ep epidemic started, started i've been taking a lot of photographs even even in the community you know a lot of people are wearing n95 masks patients uh, policemen uh, delivery boys everybody so um after having gone through the who guidelines uh, it was like a covid yet about a month ago uh, when when i got interested in and i was given an opportunity to organize this teaching program for uh, nurses and doctors in miot so we started taking photographs. So this was one of the first thing, a delivery boy or, a, an, or an executive wearing an N95 mask with only the top one under the ear. Um, so I try to tell people I teach as much as possible. But there are three mask types in, um, in uh, COVID use, the cloth mask, which reduce droplets in a person who's wearing the mask, actually. Uh, and uh, we are also encouraging everybody to wear masks now when social distancing is... Uh, a uh, little restricted. A surgical three-ply mask is very good to control droplet transmission reduction. So it is recommended in most medical uh, areas, including ICUs. And N95 respirators, the, the purpose is to reduce aerosol transmission. And uh, the, the recommendation is to use it on personnel involved in association with aerosol generating procedures. I mean, I would suggest surgeons wear N95 masks inside the operating room because uh, once your uh, anesthesia colleague intubates, there's quite a bit of aerosol generation in the room, which, which will stay there for about 50 minutes or so. It's good for you to wear the uh, N95 masks. Um, so these are the three types. The surgical mask, this is for youngsters, is a three-ply mask, has three layers. The outer one is colored blue, green, or sometimes you have orange color gloves the inner one is white the outer should be the colored one and the inner one should be white and there is a filter in between this is uh, it's quite interesting to know that this is completely waterproof most of the uh, standard uh, three ply masks which we use can hold water and uh, the inner ones even if you try to burn them it doesn't burn if that's the filter so it comes with ties or elastic band to the ears there is a metal strip on the nasal bridge now, I learned a few things about surgical masks even after being a surgeon since 1997. So you have to secure ties in the middle of the, it's on the crown of the head, the upper tie, and the lower one should be at the nape of the neck. You are, it should lie flat on your nose bridge and it should, it should be under the chin. So a lot of time it's, uh, I, don't, I don't feel that even I have been compliant with this. No, the, and the, the the point that the colored one should be outside and the white one inside is I'm hearing for the first time. I, I should uh, admit my ignorance. <laughs> sir, sir, I also was ignorant a month ago. <laughs> I don't know. So I had nurse taught this to me actually. A nurse said, uh, do you understand this? I said, really? <laughs> I was wearing for my own comfort. Uh, anyway, 
so you should fit the flexible band to your nose by bridging, I mean, pressing it gently, not with a single finger. You have to use fingers at both the sides. So there are new things that I learned. Like I said, the right orientation based on color. The upper tie goes to the crown. It goes first. And then you adjust the nose bridge. Then you tie the lower neck to the nape of the neck. And the lower margin should snugly fit and cover the chin area. And, um, and I use, a, I, I use um, uh, magnifying uh, glasses. So I usually place a sticker on my cheek so that it doesn't get fogged. Now, the second type of mask is called a filtering face piece. And um, this is quite commonly known as the N95, but uh, the, the generic name is the filtering face piece. These are US labels, okay? It's called N, R, or P. So N means it is not resistant to oil. There is an N95, N99, and an N100. So the explanation is given below, 95, 99. Airborne particles are filtered. Uh, the R and the P is based on the oil resistance. Remember that the filtering phase piece is not just used in medicine. It is used by the industry exclusively, extensively, uh, where they have more aerosol generations in painting, woodwork, um, construction industries also. So there are different types of masks that are available. Models in N95 masks. The N95 is a US-based classification. For the European standards, it's called the FFP2 or the FFP3. Uh, you should use something better than the FF FFP2 or something better, actually. So the 3M numbers, these are common ones that are available in our hospital. So I just wanted to show some shapes. Um, the, if you have the S number, which means it can fit smaller faces, and uh, you have the duckbill type and the vertically oriented one. It's a cone-shaped mask. Again, you, you have the cup-shaped respirator mask, the flat fold respirators. That's a shape-based classification. So there are some things one should look at the N95 mask, especially in this time where you're going to get N95 masks from fraudulent agencies. Uh, you should be making sure for your own safety whether you're using the appropriate N95 mask. So for N95 mask, when you buy it or get a supply, look at a few things. One, there will be always a label. There will be a number called the TC approval number, which comes from the, uh, um, it's a safety precaution from NIS or NIOSH, which is the Occupational Safety Hazard uh, Institute in US. And you will have something called a lot number. If you look at this mask, it does not have the lot number. I think it's basically because they have not, they have uh, just given a model, but you should get the lot number all the time. The, there are a lot of N95 masks without lot numbers. They cannot be trusted uh, um, uh, to do the uh, full job. No, uh, like I said, you check the uh, TC and the lot numbers, verify the source. And I have looked at some frauds, even copy TC numbers. So a 3M TC number can be easily copied. One should understand there are no N95 masks for kids. Kids don't have any such respirator masks. And also there are no cloth-based N95 masks. So there are lots of fraudulent companies which even come from China. So, so one should be very, very careful. Uh, I mean, even the local vendors tell us that uh, um, this, this does not have lot numbers. So be careful when you buy your mask. So to use an N95 mask correctly, you need a bit of training. None of us have used N95 masks regularly. So this is the way to hold it. Hold it like a cup, leave both the tags outside, place it on your nose as low as possible below the chin, fit the upper one first. The upper one goes to the crown of the head and the lower one goes below the ear into the nape. And if you have long hair, keep it under the hair. Uh, though this is the recommended one. We found that most of our nurses have smaller chins and we use, when we use cup-based respirators, we have advised them to use the lower one uh, to get below the ear and keep it on their bun. That, that's the only time when, when you get the chin fit properly. So this, we did a few uh, corrections after taking classes for them. So one, the, you have to get the orientation right in, in that the upper one, the, uh, the metal bridge must come to the top of the nose. And you can see the two flaps above and below the bun and above and below the ear. So incorrect ones are wearing it upside down or having a flap here. Uh, this is quite common among nurses and I think among most healthcare workers. And you cannot leave an N95 mask hanging from your neck. So like this was during our training one. She's wearing uh, one of the masks and uh, you can see the, the elastic band being crossed. So the next one is uh, for men especially. Um, 
uh, you should not have any beards. Uh, some people have small French beards, which are acceptable. You have to trim your facial hair to a two or, a, or anything less than three is good. We have no option of getting the fit test done in our country at this point of time. Uh, the fit test requires special equipment. We are unable to do any of them uh, now. What we do is actually a seal test to find out whether there is any leak. And one must understand that we have different shapes of N95 masks with different chin and cheek shapes. And you must always do a seal test. And even with these different shapes, some of them have exhale valves. You no, know, it's very difficult to breathe out through the N95 mask. So they have put an exhale, exhalation valve. So uh, you have a valveless N95 mask and a valved N95 mask. So for the seal test, you have to exhale for a valveless mask and inhale for a valve mask. So our, uh, our current discard policy is we teach them three Ds. Once it becomes dirty, or sometimes they damage, you know, they, they don't hold it very well and uh, the mask gets damaged, we, we ask them to discard it. And um, right now, till now, we are, nobody has complained of any difficulty in breathing. We said, if you've used the mask and it feels difficult to breathe and sometimes the filtering mechanism may be lost, you have to discard them. Uh, we have just uh, last week, we have implemented the extended uh, usage of N95 masks in the hospital. We're following two uh, protocols right now. ETO and the UV sterilization. We have got both of them ready, but they are evolving protocols. We find it very difficult because of logistics, they have to leave the mask at the doffing area and somebody collects them and brings it to the ETO room and then uh, does the ETO. It has to be sealed and then sent for the ETO. Now this is the uh, a lot of beard styles and uh, for you to understand, I, mean, I never knew that there were so many names like this, but uh, these are the uh, types where you cannot have the uh, and you cannot use the N95 marks. The best is a clean shaven one or a small mustache. So <clears throat> obviously uh, anybody who undergoes a fit test usually undergoes a cardiovascular uh, and a respiratory evaluation. We, we are not doing that. So for healthcare workers with asthma, COPD or lung issues or cardiovascular problems, uh, it is not recommended that you use the N95 masks. Now, respirators affect respiratory timings. They have lesser impact on the respiratory volume. So it is still difficult to breathe through a tightly fitting N95 mask. The, the effect is worse in asthmatics than COPD or normal people. And uh, I, I did get uh, information about an increase in heart rate when you use the N95 mask, but I was not able to pick up the right reference to share with you. But one, people with cardiovascular illness, it is not recommended that you use N95 masks. The common mistakes which we noted during the training program and the implementation is that obviously we have no fit tests. They were not doing the seal tests on a routine basis. So I, now for the few days, we are just standing there in the dawning place, checking whether they are doing the, uh, the seal test uh, regularly. And most of the nurses had uh, small faces, so they had large masks. Now we have ordered different types for them so that we tell them to remember, but it's going to get difficult at time because the different shapes for the respirators are not going to be available in a short time. And the other common one is pinching the metal strip with one hand so that there is a small ridge here through which leak happens. It's, it's very difficult to handle. That mask is pretty much lost. And keeping the elastic over the year because they tend to do it very fast and that it's okay for a short time, but if you leave for a long time, it will leave a deep mark on your, on your ear and it's not good. And keeping the elastic crossed Will, is, is a, it's not a problem when you wear it. Uh, you, will, you may feel comfortable, but when you doff, it becomes a big problem, especially when one uh, tab is under, under another, one uh, uh, tape is under the other. Uh, the other common mistakes are touching the inside of the mask when they're wearing it for several reasons. Even with the glove on, they think they are stable, but I keep telling them, don't touch your face. That's the, that's the worst thing that you can do for yourself. But it takes a little bit of time, you know. We've been doing this for the last 10 days or so. Um, and that message has not percolated well. Now, touching the outside of the mask during doffing is another common one. You have to take out the mask, N95 mask, without touching the mask at all. And, um, and people also tend to take the tape off here. You should not touch the mask. They are, they are supposed to take it off from the back. So there are plenty of good videos in, the, uh, in YouTube. Uh, which one can follow. It's, they are excellent. We love the Chinese methods of donning and doffing. Uh, we looked at uh, multiple things from US as well as UK. We were not impressed with them. 
uh, the way they doffed and donned. So we have adopted pretty much the, the, the Chinese one because we feel the Wuhan, I don't know whether it's real statistics, they did not have any healthcare workers in the latter part of the infection when it became severe. And uh, part of it is, is, is with, with good compliance in uh, PPE wearing is, is what I felt. So I like that and I have simplified it and I have trained, we have trained our nurses to do the same. Now, the third important thing is the coverall, uh, coveralls which people are using. We, we found a few pictures in LGS shared by our surgical colleagues about people wearing uh, coveralls during surgery. And um, this is one, um, one such classification. There are many classifications for coveralls. Sorry. Uh, there, uh, so, um, probably it may not matter here. What we are doing, what we are actually getting is a 60 GSM or 80 GSM water resistant uh, paper based coveralls. That's what we are getting actually. The more thicker the material, which now fly by night operators have come up, uh, people make all kinds of uh, PPEs. And we found that the thicker the material, it's more uncomfortable even for a short time. And it's very difficult to doff, especially uh, safety compromises there. We did find a, a few local companies who make very good PPEs, but I think um, because uh, the demand is very high, they are not able to meet demands from every place. <laughs> this is another classification, the hazmat suit classification. I think we are using somewhere between B and C for our uh, coveralls. Um, these are all references that are available for everyone. What we have found out, and uh, this is this is completely a, a personal opinion, uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. I would like to hear your comments about it. This is coverall versus surgical gown in SARS-CoV, and uh, COVID-2 does not infect through the skin. That's my understanding. So I read read through it. It does not infect through the skin. So exposed hair or skin uh, is not the area where it can be transmitted. I did find a lot of U.S. and U.K. and European nurses uh, going in without headgear. Uh, it was a little odd. What I found out was our nurses have a habit of touching like this. So uh, from the beginning, I made it a policy that nobody's touching the hair. So we gave them head covers. And uh, probably that uh, kind of danger will not happen within the hospital's uh, environment. They may go out and during their travel and they may relax themselves and they touch the hair and then they touch the face and possibly increase the risk of transmission. So we, we took them to a coverall based um, PPE. Now the construct in a coverall based is a single piece. It comes from the crown to the glutes or sometimes from the crown to the heel. It's a single piece. So the, the back measurement must be very good. The very good ones will enable you to squat, bend down without any difficulty. And uh, this is a test we do regularly during our purchase. And um, we have now started telling them that they should give at least a 30% lead so that the, the nurses or the healthcare worker is able to bend. Now, what are the key areas we, we notice that uh, they miss in a coverall based one is, is basically this area. Now, the Chinese and the Tyvek, DuPont Tyvek, they have a cover for this area. So they, they, they allow no contact to the skin here. So that is, that is still missing for us. Um, it, we have no need for body assist when they do a coverall because the zipping is in the front. So they don't need a coverall, they need a mirror. But uh, anyway, as a, as, a, as a safety factor, we have provided a buddy. Now, there is no ventilatory areas in, uh, in a coverall. It's completely st stuffy to wear that for a long time. And nurses are now wearing it between 9 and 12 hours, which is really tough. And um, we found that it's very difficult to get coveralls for two tall individuals, some doctors, some nurses, and really wide individuals, most of them doctors. Uh, so we had to evolve another one. The surgical gown based um, PPE, what we have done, it has a construct like this, it is piecemeal. So individual areas are possible, uh, but the uh, entire neck area, the circumferential area around the neck is completely exposed. You still need a buddy in the room, they have to do the back tie. And the back is usually a, a thinner zone, so ventilation is slightly better than a And the lower portion being like a, a wider area, you still have good air circulation. So they are able to wear a surgical gown based for a longer time. And for all body types, so you can have a thinner one, you can have a, a slightly broader one, everyone, surgical gown is a little comfortable. What 
many people, I mean, the initial fear was so high, they thought that exposing skin is, skin is very bad and they, they sort of um, um, requested a coverall for most of them. So we have trained them in that. I don't know how this is going to evolve further. So now uh, I'm sharing with what we have done in our hospital for PPEs, the donning and doffing, we have done a trailing protocol. So, uh, there may be a lot of points in which people may disagree, but this is how we evolved it. So what we have done is uh, we wanted to reduce contact points. So skin, feet and hands, including hair, we wanted to reduce contact points. We wanted to provide good coverage of mucous membranes, eye cover, nose and mouth cover. And uh, the layering has, I mean, we've looked at different protocols. They've done single layers. They've done two layers. Some Chinese hospitals have done three layers. So uh, the three layers was really stuffy when I tried it. So we have stuck to two layers so that, uh, see our uh, PPE, uh, the 60 GSM one, or sometimes the 80 GSM one still has a risk of breach. So we wanted to have one safety layer underneath. So we are doing two layers. And our t training protocol was to reduce errors to the minimum possible time, to possible extent. So, so this is one of the slides which is gone. It's duplicated. So now, how this is how we teach them. Uh, I wanted to do the same thing in LGS as well. One has to learn individual components. The sequence need not be memorized. Probably you will learn it by muscle memory. We have put up large posters in our donning and doffing area. And we have somebody who do a redo checklist. So this is a see do checklist and a redo checklist. And we don't allow them to don or doff independently yet. So we wanted them to fully remember so that they can do it on their own. They feel confident to do it. Even after the training program, standing there in the donning room and uh, looking at how many mistakes are being done, it's really disheartening. It is not a, a bulk class. We make them do individually. We stand, supervise them. And despite that, it's difficult to learn. And I think this is, this is going to be a major problem. I had, a, I had a way with nurses because they obey orders. Uh, but I'm, uh, I think um, two doctors have learned this process. Both uh, Three doctors. All of them were DMOs. They have not had a single consultant. This is going to be a major problem because doffing is something you have to learn on your own. You have to repeat the process. This is probably the mistake which is going, which a lot of surgeons are going to face. As you go senior, it is more difficult to learn. So this is a new paradigm. I think everybody should take the effort to learn for their own safety. This is, I believe, is one of the key factors for uh, people to get infected even in the OR. Even if you provide a good PPE during the doffing, they will produce aerosol. If they sh even shake it, if they contaminate, if they don't do a good hand hygiene, that risk will never become minimal. Now, what we do is we tell people to learn the individual components. As I said, the sequence is a redo or a see-do checklist. We inspect and corroborate for completion. So two people have to say, the, own, the person has to say, feel comfortable and uh, feel that the PP is okay. And the inspecting person also should do that. And during the class, we test for splash so that their confidence increases so that there is no skin contact with liquids. Now, donning is an unsterile procedure. So you cannot don the uh, uh, or the coverall and go for surgery. You have to wear a surgical gown over that, okay? So it's not possible to do donning as a sterile procedure with the coverall. You, you can only do it on a, on a surgical gown. So it's just being clean. Our simple sequence is head to foot, inner to outer, and the last one is a check. So here you see one of our nurses doing it, and uh, we, we stand there and inspect. We have three people to do it, three trainers now. So we do that individually, we check every bit of it. So we have chosen only two to keep it simple. There's a coverall, there's a surgical gown base. We, we have asked them to wear surgical scrubs, but it's still evolving. Now, this is our donning process, okay? You have a donning sequence on the right side for the surgical gown. Now, on the left side, you have a donning for the coverall. So, it starts with the hand hygiene, goes from top, a surgical cap, N95 mask, goggles, inner glove, inner shoe cover, the coverall, the outer shoe cover, the outer glove, and a check. So, we have made it very simple. It takes about 10 minutes for them to complete the process. Um, and... Um, we, 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 are, uh, we have done a few videos to check ourselves. Now, the doffing sequence is also taught individually. Um, 
this is again one of our simplified sequence. You can see our nurse educator mini standing there. Uh, we are even training our um, um, uh, cleaning staff to do this. Uh, we have done with the paramedical staff also. They have to wear the coveralls. So we have simplified even removing the coverall. We have made the uh, process simpler for them to follow uh, hygiene. They, they, we pretty much use the same technique for everybody. We ask them to learn the technique till they master it. Now the doffing errors which we found is um, we, we actually tell them not to sit while they doff. So they have to have good balance of standing on one feet while they remove the PPE. And we found that the younger ones do not have a problem, but they still have a flexibility problem at the shoulder. We asked them to actually uh, fold their hands behind so that they can keep on the intercapular gear. That is mandatory for you to catch the cap and turn it upside down for you to doff properly. So that those are all things which we learned on the ground. And uh, it's extremely common to contaminate the inner surface of the PPE. Unless you learn the doffing properly and you have done it two or three times, it is very common to doff it to contaminate the inner surface of the PPE during doffing. This is, uh, this is the commonest error we have found out, uh, even among the nurses, and I believe it will, be, it will be a very high percentage among the doctors. And I'll tell you, I've only one DMO has actually done the doffing properly. We, we, we have also had difficulty in getting them to come down for the training. And uh, the other one is the common problem is touching the outer surface of the mask. Um, during doffing, you are not supposed to touch the mask at all. And people remove the glove with bare hands. I mean, they put the hand inside the glove and they pull out and they touch, and they invariably touch the outer surface of the hands. So that is also not recommended. There is a process to remove, especially like how when we operate on hep C patients or heavy patients, you have to do a double glove and the removing of the double glove, there is a process. Now, this is our uh, c do checklist. And... Uh, this is, uh, this is one of the pictures during, my tra during our training. This is me wearing the surgical gown based donning. Um, uh, I have tried the coverall. I have done both the, both the things. So I had to write the protocol. So I did both. So this is in our uh, training class. And this is now put up in both the donning and the doffing areas that people can do it. The third key thing which we found in uh, battling COVID was... Can we uh, have a discussion at this point of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I wish I had brought my slides too. Uh, uh, we were similar in technique and uh, I think Patta sir will probably learn on Monday. So we actually use, uh, uh, we say single layer and double layer, which is your two layers and three layers. So everybody wears a scrubs. And then if it's going to be a critical zone, for example, critical care, we wear two layers above it. One is a full suit and then an apron. So, and we don't have, uh, due, we schedule them for six hours. So they stay in the same suit for six hours and then doff, have a bath. We have a decontamination area where they go have a bath and change and come out of the duty. That's how it's planned as of now. So uh, according to donning and doffing, as you said, we also have a chair for the doffing. Because often we find it very difficult without a chair. So they are given a chair and it's stuck on the wall. Another person supervises the doffing. So one person removes this, one person supervises it. And you can use a chair because when they take it down the leg, it often becomes a problem. Till this, somehow it works off. Beyond that, it doesn't work. So we tell them to take it down, sit, and then take it off. So chair is also given to them for that purpose. So the ICU is designed in a specific way. We have a huge inner ICU and a corridor. So they have a doffing area and donning area. And after that, it's cleaned off. Um, few more things I wanted to point out. So you're talking about this uh, N95 mask. So we have two, three patterns of N95, which is what was available. We couldn't get anything more. So what we do is we ask them to smell test us. So as soon as they uh, wear the N95... We can see only half your face. It'd be nice I'm sorry. Your full face. Is this okay now? Little, uh, yeah, fine. Okay. So we ask them to smelly test. So after they wear the N95, they're made to wear the goggle because a commonest leak happens here. So your goggles or glasses get flooded. And we give them something to camphor or cigarette or something to smell. A good N95, if it is fitting properly, if there is a, if there is a seal, you should not be able to smell. So, uh, for example, we tried it. The problem is most of the indigenous masks, the, the smell is still, they're still able to smell the mask, smell it. 
So that's been a big problem. We are trying with various masks, but except for the 3M one, we have the duck mouth one. That's the only one which has given a seal till now. I've asked for two more brands probably coming on Monday, Tuesday. Dr. So, Vijayalakshmi, that's the same problem we had. We found that the ductile fits our nurses' chins very well. That's all. I think they, are, they have two small faces for the actual 3M. And the S model in 3M is not available anywhere. Yes. Even the other models are not available now. Whatever we have, it's ah, yeah. gone. So I have around 3,000 duck mouths. That's it. Now, we have made our own innovations. For example, for me, even the other brand, Indian brand, if I wear here and here, it's still loose. So I circle it around the here and wear it. I can't use it for six hours. I stay for an hour or so it's easy. If I have to use it for six hours, that's it. It's a total goner. So individually, people train for fit. So surgeons and anesthetists are just trying it out. And yes, it's looking bleak. But I understand by mid-May, we are going to have more things coming from 3M. And also from the other brand. Two brands uh, are going to produce uh, more. I doubt it. That's not my purchase team. <laughs> That's what my purchase team sells me. Uh, at this juncture, uh, Ilango, uh, can we open the thing for discussion? Any comments from the audience? I, but I have only yeah. one question before others come in. For how many more months should we be doing this? Sir, uh, we should learn to live with this. It's not going to go away. This is not like a tsunami. It's going to come in waves. It's going to stay with us. So we should evolve in such a way that we live with it. Dr. Bashi. Yes, it is not a tsunami. It is going to be like a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> that is the best thing because you don't know when it is going to end. It's not. Uh, no, now I, I have a few few questions in the sense. Uh, now, uh, in the operating theater, do we have to follow the whole thing for all elective cases? No, sir. Uh, huh? No, sir. We. Uh, uh, I think uh, I don't know whether you got the uh, categorization and stuff. So we're uh, going to take an emergency. We're going to have that. We have, like. I think it's a common okay. forum. We have a negative pressure OT and the regular OT. So okay. we have an OT which is negative pressure and which is smaller, nearer to the emergency room. So okay. in that OT, if somebody has to go, they'll be either using paper, that powered air respirator, or a properly fitted N95 mask. Anesthetist will go. They will intubate. I've said. 30 minutes after uh, listening to Ilango, I'm making it 45 minutes now. Yeah. Only after 45 minutes, the surgical team and the nurses will enter in. And uh, either with paper, I mean the powered air respirator or a properly fit N95, we will do it there. If we okay. have time for a week or two, we will evaluate and do it slowly. Now patients uh, in front, regarding my department, now when I operate a cardiac case, which is uh, of course by all tests, two weeks we did negative, I do an operation shift to the ICU. The, so they have to follow the routine things or any other precautions we have to take in this epidemic pandemic time. Uh, where they also have to be uh, taking in consideration that the patient is uh, taken as a positive case, even though tests are negative. So how should we, that is a big question mark, which I am uh, I'm, I'm raising in the sense, we, we are, you know, have, as such, we are planning to do only cases which are negative by the test, whatever available, I was telling the other day. Now I start uh, doing a case electively. So, do I have to do all these procedures for doing the cases? How do how do we go about it? Sir, as of now, our investigatory modalities are not great. We are learning. Like, for okay. example, if you started it early, early February and all, King's yeah. Institute results were not great. Now, they're giving very good results. Last month, Newberg was not doing well. Now, the positivity rate has gone up. As okay. people evolve, the reporting rates will be much better. We will get antibody tests also. We will mm. have a rough idea of how much of population is immune. We will have okay. a rough idea of that two negatives will, in, will invariably be negative. A CT being negative and a negative COVID test, we can assume at that point of time to be probably not COVID. It is going to take some time. So I would say another two months, we will be much more secure. Mm. So we... Yeah, so we, have, we we take all the precautions in doing... As, no, so uh, as of cases. now, emergency yeah. case, you have to go with full PPE, okay, probably okay. a paper. All these uh, high-risk cases, okay. they'll use a powered air respirator. Okay. Like, and, uh, uh, if it's going to be elective case, we will do the testing and you need not go with full thing. And N95 is an option which the department will decide because it's completely, if it's completely figured out, because most of us are wearing N95 like a 3M. If you are able to breathe freely, then it's not N95. It's only a three-ply mask. It's like uh, now a think, problem. Yeah. Now I think from listening to all these things, I think we have to uh, like we did our MBBS training. 
with the wearing all these things uh, should be a training period for all of us you know yes, sir. maybe i, no, I think uh, doing aortic surgery will be easier yeah operation must be, <laughs> i think do, the wearing all these things and removing this will take more time and also as you all were discussing unless it is properly done with all meticulous way the whole thing is a waste one person you know touches outside the mask or outside the gloves the whole uh, is so it is it is very education i think is the most important we we'll have to spend a lot of time from the sweeper in the theater to the chief of the uh, of the unit everybody has and also icu staff so many people have to be really trained i don't know how we have to we do about that there is only worry we are doing it for two months now you should ask the trauma team they are no. doing with three layers they are literally crying three layers <laughs> n95 mask and a paper on he is saying i am not able to move my arms <laughs> now the air condition Air condition. You have something to say? I could see. Dot. You know, in the audience. Dot. You know, are you there? Yes. Now wait. I'll just. Uh... Just join. Yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. No, I was just uh, uh, listening, but uh, yeah, it is. I I completely agree with the. Uh, thing i mean basically in uh, in velor we we started uh, you know with the uh, with the 95 marks and everybody is sort of getting trained and things and i completely agree with the difficulty of doing it properly uh, i think as dr bashu was saying that's the key in all this but uh, i missed the first part of the uh, talk uh, dr elango's talk and the discussion so uh, But are you doing all this now i have started in cmc velo we have we been uh, we are we have been operating on elective cases and uh, last week we started uh, or sorry earlier this week we started on the malignancies so that's where we have reached as of now we are not doing any other electives now uh, as of now dr patta but any any other comment before uh, elango starts his thing on the uh, the theater and other arrangements sir if any question pertaining it will take it before going to the next level so zoning is going to be another big discussion yeah, no i think no, i think we'll we'll go ahead i i, I have no okay subramaniam is there if is there you can unmute and comment kannan and i think ma can please carry on okay uh, again one thing every time you wear n95 please uh, initially just do the smelling test because that seems to matter a lot and some of them even with the local brands are not able to smell they it's fitting perfectly it's finally the fit and how we maintain it uh, mahesh you got a question yes sir can you hear me sir no yeah yeah sir uh, i saw a slide regarding n95 mask for asthmatics and copd um i couldn't understand much should we be wearing some other mask or the pap <coughs> what should we do I am an I am an asthmatic. I can tell you, I can stay in N95 mask at the maximum for uh, half an hour to 45 minutes, and then I feel I feel very difficult. So unfortunately, I am not a surgeon. Fortunately, I am not a surgeon. So I go to the isolation ward, don, finish your rounds, come back, remove it. So, I mean, for some time it's difficult. Then I am okay. <laughs> so Mahesh, you have to change your profession in case. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mahesh, uh, I am an asthmatic too. I we are. Uh, it is difficult, I would say. But right now we are doing only procedures. Um, we have not used N95 during our procedures. Uh, but uh, I have worn it. I have tried it for uh, for a longer time, and I stayed in that ward during the training process. It is difficult, but it is wearable. You can you can tolerate up to one and a half two hours. You cannot do a whipple or a hepatectomy with an N95 mask and things like that. I am not doing any other stuff. Stuff. Oh, oh, the PAPR is, uh, is the resistance less in that the PAPR. A poor fit oh, yeah. for people with poor fit PAPR is good. Again, your PAPR also has to fit properly to you. So at this point of time, we really have limited amount, and so what we advise is. we ask them to use a n95 and a papr only thing is i am at least comfortable that if the n95 is not fitting they have another added protection so mm -hmm. probably the more information will come in with time we have we have four n four paprs with around 10 hoods we are just working on it we'll get some answers probably another 10 days time sorry if i got you right uh, you're saying n95 and over that a papr 
yes as of now because papr also has to fit so there is a zone here which doesn't like we have not had the company person talking to us yet so there is a part here which doesn't look like snugly fitting everybody so the biggest worry is it may be leaking for some people so now we have just started using paper now it's there with us for nearly 4 5 days so we are giving them n95 and papr probably a week or two once we get all the material and how people are using it i can answer your question probably i can mail you at that time uh, uh okay uh, uh, mithilakshmi do nscts uh, don themselves address themselves differently sir actually uh, you're talking about donning of these uh, no i mean do their material different from the rest because they are much more exposed to all this no sir like we are having two two layer like he said two layer and uh, one layer we are using two layers or three layers we are not using one layer so basically above the scrubs you wear the full suit and then you wear a apron that's what we use for the icus theaters lot of people are worried about two layers and three layers some of them are not comfortable with three layers because the ortho guy they use lead apron also so we are still I, working on that now the point is anesthetists are actually much more uh, careful they are very careful with their n95 mask they use the video laryngoscope they make sure everything is perfect and i think the problem is that doesn't percolate to everybody else in the theater that might be the issue that's my assumption because anesthetists know that they are very high risk so they are very careful about everything that doesn't happen to others now I, i Uh, am i audible yeah, yes sir uh, now uh, see one of the problems in long cases and you know, all like our anesthetic sometimes will go out of the theater and come back and their coffee break and all we will have to stop probably i don't know how they are man- going to manage if they are keep on going in and out of the theater will be a problem no that is one thing especially in long cases sir. how are they, they going to manage out, sir. how can uh, they have coffee sir, with all these things on they <laughs> 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 can't even go to the toilet Yeah. <laughs> you cannot sir you cannot sir you yeah. cannot actually uh, see long uh, we we now allow our nurses to take a break once yeah. and we ask them to drink enough water when they go inside we yeah. tell them to drink at least a liter of water and uh, in china they were wearing diapers i mean yeah. this was not acceptable to any of our nurses but i think uh, the chinese nurses wore diapers because they never broke their pp for 12 hours that that is really great Is that right, Doctor Vijay Lakshmi? That's yeah, what I, I heard. Yeah, I guess we should never cross four to six hours in that suit. So as mm-hmm. of now, our principle is uh, like we are trying with the ER doctors now from tomorrow probably. So we are trying to ask them to use it for six hours at the maximum. Beyond that, it's I don't think it will work because they will do. They will find some way to come out of it, but there is no point. How many hours you give? They have to be comfortable yeah. in it, and finally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Even don't know. Uh, what is the question that Rakesh Cutter wants to ask? Question. Yeah, I I just want to ask: Is it uh, important to wear face shield during the OPD, uh, sitting in the OPD, examining patients? Is the face shield important? Uh, sir, uh, I use. I see. I see COVID cases every day. I wear a three ply mask and a normal glove. I keep the patients a meter away. My door is always open. so generally that should be enough because the contact time is less than 1 meter for more than 15 minutes you can get exposed or you know physically touch them and touch your face so avoid both of these things i might have maintain more than 1 meter distance if i have to put a line or do some intimate procedure then i wear the whole thing and take my word last two two months i've never had to wear the whole thing in my opd and what about the day care surgery if you do a uh, local anesthesia procedure in the minor theater do you have to do uh, wear the proper ppe or just a uh, three ply mask and a glove it, will do it depends upon the risk assessment because uh, if you put intubate a patient the risk becomes higher if it's going to be a local procedure we encourage lot of regional anesthesia and spinal anesthesia now now lot of the other surgeries are done run in regional and spinal anesthesia which is really good but still you cannot make it zero if the risk is pretty high please make sure you follow all the precautions Still, okay. it's a positive pressure uh, environment. That's the problem. So, if you can do it in a negative pressure, that helps more. Again, if it's a high risk patient, use all the precautions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mahesh, Dr. Rakesh, before uh, Ilunga starts again, Mahesh, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rakesh, I do a lot of AV fistulas under local. Okay. So, what we do, what we do is we make the patient wear a mask. All right. Yeah. So, if people wear a mask, 
the transmission you know, drops down to less than 2 percentage so that's another know, precaution these days elective surgeries has gone down so you tend to take up lot of local anesthesia cases by putting in the opd so I just did few cases wearing a mask and ordinary gloves, but obviously the screening is important before you do those cases. Uh, so that is why I asked that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mahesh, your last question before Ilango starts again. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the N100 mask, is it available and is it worthwhile to procure it? I don't know, sir. The maximum I could get was N95, not even N99, so I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, Dr. Oh, Dr. Dr. Shahana has an interesting question. Even I had that question. I, even regular surgery, I should ashamed to admit that I don't close my nose. My specs get fogged. How to you, prevent fogging? So uh, now, uh, so that's the fit. That's the nose fit, sir. Ah. So you have to fit it correctly. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, wearing our regular specs during uh, it fitting N95 is difficult. Mm -mm -mm. But uh, once, so that's why I said you have to fit as low as possible to your comfort, not very high on the nose, so that your bridge, I mean, glasses will be lifted up. Okay. Uh, some bit of fogging will be there. Some bit of fogging will be there. Maybe I should try some plasters also. A friend of mine says that after putting some plasters, it's, he feels much better. Okay. Is it possible to put a, a magnifying loop on N95 mask? Is it possible? Anybody can answer. I have not used yeah, it so far. Using, yeah. uh, sir, no, I have not tried, sir, honestly. <laughs> because I have to use loop for all my cases. I can't even take a single yeah. skin stitch without my loop. That's my, my problem. <laughs> I guess Maybe. even uh, neurosurgeons use a microscope. Apparently, now with the paper on, they are working on using the microscope. So you start okay. doing it, you will learn, you will find some, evolve some technique. Yeah, we have to uh, you know, find out ways and means to tide over that. That's the only way. Sir, uh, like, sir. Bashi, sir? Yeah. Sir, the, the Venus mask which is available, it's little more flexible than the 3M one. Okay. Its fit is also good. I okay. think with that, uh, you can use your loops. Okay. I guess okay. also well. <laughs> is it really? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, we'll continue. Yeah. So, um, okay, so we have, we have we have come to zoning. Okay, so um, we did some working uh, in the initial phase. We had lots of issues with donning and doffing before we took in. So now we have divided it into this is uh, uh, this is just evolved for our hospital, and I think the zoning labeling is 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 not is just what we chose. So the green zone is where you can walk up there till your uniform, your uniform or your regular dress. This is, there's a small buffer zone. And then we have marked a donning area inside the room for both males and females separately. And uh, it does red zone is the contaminated zone. So people are completely in PPE here. So this is theory. Okay. So I found that we have marked these places with tapes. And we still find that the nurses just walk across these zones uh, without understanding. And what I find difficult to believe is some of the doctors also do that. And uh, the, the administration has stepped up, put posters. Now, you've just got it in the control. I think people learning zoning takes a little bit of time. And uh, they're all catching up, especially with the numbers going up. People are more conscious. So the red zone involves uh, patients where you have positive stable patients in the wards. You have suspected COVID ill patients, uh, COVID positive, just hypoxic. We have separate areas for critical COVID where they can do dialysis. The doffing area and the donning area are completely separate. The doffing area is called the yellow zone and it exits through a separate fire, fire escape. Now, stable suspect COVID patients have a separate ward, uh, both general and uh, with, with good social distancing. Uh, we have made about three, four meters distance between the individual beds. We've cut down the number of beds in that block. So that's how we zone. And uh, the theater zoning is still, uh, it's not in place for us. We are just thinking about it. Uh, there are a lot of discussions that are going on. We have not reached any conclusion. I can take some suggestions on that. Uh, so this is what we're doing. So now common mistakes which we have found. Uh, so 
during this training and in the implementation, these are the mistakes which we saw, saw in COVID care. Remember that I'm a transplant surgeon, so I actually am not an ID specialist. I have done all these things with the intent of training nurses because I have, we have just kept our uh, transplant program quiet for the next couple of months till we have see how the COVID evolves. Um, these are the common mistakes which we saw. These were poor hand hygiene, you no, know, especially the more senior the doctor it is, it is very easy. I mean, include, that includes me too, you know. I just go there, somebody gives some rub, we do this, and that's it. That's our hand hygiene. That's, that, that mistake, first I admitted to myself, I corrected it. Nowadays I take time to do it, I encourage whomsoever. So that was the first mistake. The second mistake is N95 failures. I was disheartened to see that initially uh, with swine being used since the time of swine flu, now we corrected most of them. Now fitting is good and uh, they're all using the N95, but we still see nurses wearing it upside down with cross straps, uh, touching the outside of the mask is there. And disrespecting zones in an ID ward is still happening, but it's beyond uh, my, my time. I think the administration is taking great interest in it to actually mark down the zones and uh, doing a perfect job. Uh, we did the initial uh, marking and zoning. It's, it's taking on very well. Um, the, there are doffing failures. Obviously, contaminating the inside of the hospital, uh, inside of the gown, is very common. Uh, the people find it very difficult to balance. Now, like Dr. Vijayalakshmi was saying, we have put two chairs actually without armchair arches. It's almost like a stool. One is labeled dirty and the other is clean. Especially since we have nursing superintendents more than 60 years of age, we had to adjust those things. The girls were quite good at it. And I found sometimes even, I mean, I have done this a few times. It's very difficult to doff. Sometimes you may fall, you may touch uh, other people with your gloves. So we thought it's good to have a stew. We have no buffer room or zone in the operating room yet. That has to be created. It is recommended. And right now, uh, um, this, I, I prepared the slide, but I found out that there's a negative pressure room. It's easily set up in most of the theaters in MIOT. And remember, for surgeons, anesthesia is the greater risk. It is not your procedure. So there are a few surgical procedures which you may do, which increases the risk. One is rigid bronchoscopy, tracheostomy. I believe that if you have, if you have more critical COVID patients, general surgeons will be doing most of the tracheostomies or ENT surgeons. That's a high risk procedure. For some reason, dental and orthopedic drilling. Dental, I can understand it's an oral mucosa. But I don't understand why orthopedic drilling will, is, a, is considered a high risk procedure. Now, some of the technical cheat sheets that are given here for anesthesia, especially. So um, the intubation should be done by the senior most anesthetist, the most experienced one, the one who's capable of doing it single shot. Video laryngoscope is recommended. So those are stuff that is anesthesia, which is not my, uh, not our cup of tea. I think they know better. We are just, just discussing from the point of surgeons. So my suggestion, this is not level one evidence, obviously. Coverall is need, not needed for any of the surgical procedures for the surgeons. You can use an N95 mask. If you're very uncomfortable, if you wear specs like me, you can use a, 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 a face shield. You use a plastic apron inside a good surgical gown. That's more than sufficient. This is what we do in transplants most of the time, it's standard. We wear shoe covers, now we are wearing two shoe covers, that's all. There is an inner simple shoe cover and an outer plastic shoe cover. That's a standard transplant uh, gowning. And uh, the recommended one is stay out of the OR when he's being intubated. The best recommended time is about 45 minutes. It's not possible to stay, the anesthetist really gets wild. So 30 minutes is good enough for, uh, for staying outside. Anesthesia should be in full coverall with face shield N95. They are really good at it. That is why, because they are very careful, they have less infections. I think the, the teams which got infected with orthopedic surgeons, uh, cardiac surgeons, um, transplant surgeons, surprisingly during donor runs, they have got infected with uh, COVID. Um, one of the first UK doctors to die was a transplant surgeon. The other one is to use a HME filter. My anesthetist says the HME filter also filters viruses, um, but the recommendations do say that you have to use a separate viral filter apart from the HME filter. You can cover the face with a plastic cover when you extubate. The tube comes out along with the plastic cover and goes straight to the bin. So that is one method. And uh, 
our hospital also has procured a, a shield for the uh, extubation, intubation time so that the anesthetist risk is very much reduced. Yeah. And now the surgical team, I, I would recommend you leave the room before extubation. That's, that's actually best. And practice good hand hygiene, obviously. Some of us just walk to the, uh, the computer room, touch other things. Uh, it may not be a great percentage, but it is recommended that you wash your hands back once again, a proper surgical scrub, and then finish the surgery. And obviously, it is good to minimize your staff, uh, whose presence, uh, I mean, the number of PPEs also goes up, and we are not getting enough PPEs, so it's good to minimize your staff within the operating room. So, this is the question and discussion, and I would like to know if there are some things I have missed, and you can give our feedbacks. Oh, first, you must be having so much of space. I mean, a separate area for COVID. That's a luxury. Ah, it is. Uh, that's a large space, actually. I mean, they, Dr. Prithvi Mohandas put a separate block for that. Uh, he shifted the ma internal medicine, the respiratory OPD there. Um, all the wards have been converted to COVID. Most of the other patients have been shifted back to the main block. That is a luxury, I mean. So, I mean, we are very lucky in that. I, mean, I think it was built for the hospitals. Most of the hospitals cannot do that. So I work in a couple of hospitals. One of floor, the seventh floor is completely converted to COVID. One particular floor is converted. In uh, in Sims, what we have done is we have actually designed four uh, rooms with a big anti room and negative pressure and uh, video cameras and a computer outside. So the nurse sits in the anti room, goes in, longer lines, finish off everything. Basically designed for intubated patient. The patient is not intubated. We are planning to use it as what? We are assuming we won't get a huge number. So as of now, those four beds and one more area on the third floor. And we have a negative pressure OT as the most of the hospitals will have this emergency OT or the dirty OT, which will be separate from the main OT. Like if we can convert that into a negative pressure or COVID OT, that should be a good idea. What you require is you need an exhaust and a HIPAA filter around where, where the exhaust ends. So a separate uh, AC chamber. So it should not be very difficult. It should be doable. So that will convert a single, the smallest OT into a negative pressure OT, preferably away from the main OT complex. So, so that you have a doffing, donning area, it should be away and contamination is less. That really should help. Um, a separate area so that patients, uh, other patients do not walk and do not walk across that area is definitely going to uh, uh, Dr. Jalakshmi, uh, who will be doing the policing? Because you are not there all the time. Yes, sir. I don't know, Ilongo may be there all the time. But who will, I think we, uh, we Indians will require uh, somebody with a, a cane in his or her hand and make sure all these things are done, at least for a month. Who will do that? Sir, even if I am around, I am not good at uh, giving a bite through the cane, sir. So <laughs> the problem is... Only some people, probably Ilongo can do it. Maybe somebody from your department. No, 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 no. I can't do it. I can't do it. No, I mean. <laughs> who, who will so do we, this quality control? So at this point of time, we have people training individually. So frankly speaking, quality control is just auditing and telling people. So nobody is punishing anybody. I don't know. We may have to go to that level if things don't work out. Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, whenever I did know, Patasa actually taught me the Kahoot uh, uh, test. We actually, uh, when we initiated hand hygiene, we gave them Kahoot test. You know, they really enjoyed it. Okay. Now, Dr. Ilongo, uh, are you doing elective cases? Uh, yeah, sir. Are now, you doing, Dr. Ilongo? Ilongo. Yeah. Hello. Are you doing elective cases? Yes, sir. I am doing elective cases. But most of them are AV fistulas and uh, a few lab colleagues. That's it. And our team also has done a, those were emergencies actually. We had to do a few uh, complicated surgeries um, in the last couple of weeks. Are you doing hernia? Elective Elective no. hernia? No, 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 no elective procedures. No. Sir, uh, we are not doing any elective surgery at all. All right. At all. Thank now, my worry is, uh, suppose whoever is policing, maybe one senior nurse, can they dare ask uh, or order Dr. Bashi anything? They'll be too no, no, no. <laughs> no problem. For me, I, I always used to tell from the very beginning, last 40 years, I used to tell anybody 
because i was regarding sterile things so this one also is easy for me because i used to make sure that the the, the whoever makes a mistake in the theater in sterility precautions immediately put where is the boss of the unit don't worry if i make a mistake immediately should be pointed out i never get upset with it in fact if somebody does not point out to me i will be very upset that is the way i used to function and always i used to say that you know the it is so important from the cleaning person to the head of the department to follow all the rules and i'm very particular about that so if somebody makes a mistake even some uh, some visiting surgeons used to get upset with me because they don't wear the mask properly they just come and i, I always uh, excuse me sir please put your mask nicely down properly and don't touch the because the drapes i'm very very concerned about that because you know when you deal with the uh, prosthesis <laughs> inside the heart every day so this uh, i don't think it will be a big problem for me only thing i feel that every department head has to make sure one person or two person is uh, first employed i mean trained i would say uh, trained and then they should make sure that it, it should be done. otherwise it is going to be a big confusion because one person makes a mistake everything the whole thing is gone true yes sir yeah is like in one major operation one uh, if the person the fellow who clean the theater does not clean it properly that's you know the whole whatever you do is a waste so like that it has to be see in general of course the theater main theater in charge the sister and the other paramedical staff has to make sure whether it is the head of the department or the director of the unit or the chairman or whatever it is x y or z there is no covid is not uh, immune to anybody <laughs> everybody can get that it has been proven so it is uh, of utmost importance that the leaders show the way so that we don't make any mistake so that you know so like if i don't do if I make any mistake everybody will say oh, dr bashi is doing like that okay we will we will follow that's the thing so we have to be the leaders has to be very very careful and they should learn and then make sure others does not make a mistake that's what i feel uh, any, add any... on to one more thing yeah. we i believe we we started with a bottom up approach so basically everything starts from the head and goes down but when we started this we started from bottom approach bottom up approach basically because the person if the housekeeping person develops a cough or cold even if we cleans everything is going to be futile we spent almost a month just sitting on the housekeeping i know now it takes almost an hour to clean a er bed it takes 30 minutes to clean a ct room a cubicle takes anywhere between 20 to 25 minutes now the given is you measure the timing they have to take that much time that's all is given to others so basically unless the housekeeping do the proper work it doesn't work they have to be given ppes they have to work on it another thing is every day morning we have to check the check all the i mean should be nurses or housekeeping each unit will have to check the team members anybody has some symptoms make sure they go away immediately because it is indian mentality for us to work with minor symptoms and that is enough to make a big epidemic so this is something we need to follow throughout for the next 3 to 6 months yeah i think i think we realized that same thing from our training program as well so the um the cleaning team comes once in 3 days for the same pp hand hygiene and uh, um respiratory hygiene class so uh so we we had we had to do the same thing for the ambulance drivers as well it is not just the hand rub alone or uh, one hand wash they have to show it again and again we want to keep them safe because they uh, they really go and uh, touch many surfaces so we also added one more thing i don't know whether it's correct or not the uh, the glove uh the covid virus can stay in the gloves for up to 8 hours as per as per all the studies given and uh, the chinese people use something to decontaminate i, I thought they are using bacillosid it's given in chinese so i'm not able to get that but we also found some people using hypochlorite so i did some work on that and found that hypochlorite uh, can on the gloves is really safe uh, 1% hypochlorite so what we have done is uh, uh, we have provided them with buckets so that they just rub it so that the contamination risk for the cleaners is lessened we are not reusing the gloves we just wanted to reduce that factor as well we don't have solid data on that i was just looking into it this adds one layer of complexity for the doffing process but this we thought we should do it good for the cleaners i mean uh, no, nobody from the higher up is going to get affected that that's the 
people who may get affected. So we want to follow that as well. But we are doing this on a regular basis. So this is this is our part. There are some few questions, but as a Adding on to it, during the doffing, our sequence involves hand rub in between. So we had we use a two glove technique, and we also use hand rub in between. So like it's all indigenously designed. I didn't get involved at all. It is designed by my infection control nurse and my resident because they are in the field. So I both the hospitals have totally different technique. I let them design it, and it's working. Oh yeah. Any questions, Mahesh? Uh, what is your question before we wind up? Yeah, something Raj. There are a few chat questions. Yeah, the chat questions are um, face shield versus use of goggles while operating. So which is comfortable? Okay. So uh, we are using the. Glasses. By, by, we are not using this what the sheet thing. We are getting this uh, bike visors. So uh, some okay. have come in because it's going to be more sturdy, and I thought easy to clean too. So we are getting some uh, bike visors, and that's going to be used in the in the emergency theater. Okay. Uh, any so, special measures to decrease aerosol generation during surgery, like cautery settings, etc.? They actually cautery settings do not have anything, sir. Uh, it is from the tissue. Most of them are burnt. It's a high temperature contact point, so okay. they are not the risk point, sir. The risk point is aerosol creation during respiratory handling. See, the only other risk is autopsy or maybe lung surgeries. You know, you cannot do lung surgeries. You right. touch them, that might be a little risk. So okay. apart from that, GIT using cautery for opening and nothing is nothing. I looked at most of the stuff. There is no evidence for that. Autopsy, when you have to handle the lungs, is probably an aerosol generating procedure and there is a risk of transmission. So if you uh, extrapolate that to uh, thoracic surgery, I think handling lungs, uh, in a suspect COVID is a risk. That's all. Um, uh, Deepa Raj wants to know what are the intraoperative things to keep in mind? Anything right now, I don't think so. They should change any surgical techniques, sir. As long as, I mean, they are not touching the lungs, they are avoiding the respiratory aerosols during intubation and extubation. Uh, apart from that, I think they are fine. I think there is no intraoperative things to worry uh, at that time. It's very difficult to wear the PPE and do it. Probably if wherever you can go for regional anesthesia, maybe go for it rather than GA. At least for some time. For example, if a diabetic foot or deliveries can go for spinal and local anesthesias, regional blocks, can use it more than GA wherever you can. Uh, how to sterilize the instruments and OT Standard. after the procedure. Standard. Standard. Nothing new. Uh, okay, if any, any further comments? Sir, I have a question, Dr. Mahesh here. Yes, yes sir. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, actually, um, yes, you had mentioned uh, uh, that uh, regular operating theater can also be uh, converted to a negative pressure OR. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just uh, give us some reference, some uh, you know some resources which we can look up. I, I I will I'll ask my people and send it across to you because we had a separate theater which had uh, HIPAA filter laminar floats. It was a separate theater. So what we did is uh, we put an exhaust pipe and it went out and added a HIPAA filter to it and we put a separate age. It had a common age. We put a separate uh, AC. That's what we did. So, for converting a positive to negative, I'll just ask them. I was told that that also can be done. But you need to have a separate unit. The AC unit has to be separate. The biggest problem is we will have AC unit for two, three theaters together. That's when the trouble comes. So, I'll find out and message you. Sir. There is something so called... the AHU must be separate. The, you mean the theater AHU must Individual. be separate? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, ours was not separate. So, we closed it. We put a separate AC. And a separate exhaust and finish it was because the theater was behind. So we had an access outside. We used that. Uh, Nyan Sheridan, what is your question? Good evening, sir. I have a silly question. Please help me out. Uh, in our department, we have all bought 995 with the valve, sir. Is there any disadvantage in that? My medicine colleague seems to have seen the valve on the inner side. Uh, well, the oh, point is. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. The quality, but N95 with valves should be same as N95 without valve. The only problem at this point of time is the quality of N95s. So we really don't know about that. As I said, 
just smell and see after you seal it please use all how much ever tapes you want no uh, uh, illago which is the most user friendly bus user friendly none sir <laughs> None. None. No, 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 I should wear a mask, and I should, I should feel that I am wearing a mask. That should be then. That three ply, sir. <laughs> okay. Ibrahim wants Muhammad Ibrahim wants to know why. What is the, the regarding high speed drills and bone saw? How do they generate aerosols? So basically, aerosols are uh, small particles. Like it can be any kind of blood or respiratory mm -hmm. secretion. any secretions which is coming out is smaller ones as you drill the size of the particle probably goes down right. and as it disperses in the air when the size becomes smaller it stays in the air for a longer time if it's a larger droplets it falls to the ground in a positive pressure atmosphere staying in the air will be for a longer period of time that's the reason all these things comes because with the high speed drilling the ch chance of the particle become smaller is bigger that's right anyway i thought uh, we had a wonderful discussion and uh, uh, a very apt and very timely and i think i, I thank uh, ilango uh, vijayalakshmi and dr bashi and all others for being a part of it and i think i should play this video every day every single day on the learning channel surgery till maybe we should have another uh, uh, get together next week uh, more or less the same time and see where have we advanced thank you once again thank, thank you all you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you